<clears throat> hit the record real quick. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so today we're going to really dive into the topic of archetypes. This is something um, that I've been really studying a lot from many different angles. Um, and we're going to talk about what archetypes really are, how they play out in our life. We're going to talk about some of the archetypes, but it's, it's a really, really deep conversation. So we're going to really use our time as effectively as possible and bring a few things home for everybody. I've been really studying this on and off just as, just as a connection to everything else that I study um, in the fields of human potential and developmental psychology um, and spiritual principles and transformation. And so that's, you know, one of the words that, that Roxanne brought up was um, going into di different dimensions of conversations in these calls. And that's really a good word to use because archetypes do represent different dimensions of the human experience, of the human psyche, really. And when we talk about transformation, one of the key principles is that in order for transformation to, to occur, you literally have to embody a different version of yourself than you had become accustomed to, than you were before, right? That's, that's the whole point of transformation, is that you can't be the same person with the same character, um, let's just call it flaws, or the same character, um, the same personality, traits or the same level of traits that you were at one particular stage in the journey. So there is an initiatory um, principle to all of this. And there's a lot of talk around the world um, and on social media about transformation and doing transformational programs. Um, but unfortunately, most people that do transformational programs don't transform. They, they, they have a glimpse or an experience of what a transformation could feel like but they don't actually cross the, cross the bridge. And there's a reason for that. There's a lot of reasons for that. And it's actually depicted in some of the greatest mythological stories that we all resonate with. And that's one of the reasons that stories are actually so impactful um, is because they, they, are, they are encoded with universal archetypes that are universal to the human experience, that we all actually, on a soul level, we have that information encoded inside of us, right? But then what ends up happening is we bump up against the, the, the material world and the world of, that we have created or unconsciously created within ourselves and, and around us that we have become accustomed to. So that world actually has to disintegrate in a sense, not necessarily in a physical sense, but some things do have to kind of loosen their grip. Reality has to loosen its grip a little bit in order for a new reality to emerge. So one of the archetypes is the archetype of the Phoenix, you know, from this perspective of transformation. And that's really just um, what, what comes out of the ashes right? When one phase of life is complete and everything that we had become accustomed to essentially disintegrates into the ashes and then something new is born out of that. That's the whole, that's the whole phoenix rising from the ashes story or archetype or metaphor that most of us are familiar with. And if everyone could put their, their phone or their computer on mute, that'd be great. So that's, that's, one, that's one universal theme of transformation. And in order for that to actually take foot, um, there's an there's a activation of information that has to occur within each human being. And so we'll let's see, I was muted. We'll go a little bit more into all of that. Um, so what are archetypes, first of all? Well, archetypes are basically disembodied spiritual forces that are seeking to embody themselves through matter or through human beings, let's say, right? So basically archetypes are on one level, they're parables, they're stories, they're themes that occur in our life that seem to be um, universally relative that you know, this is why we, we resonate so much with stories. That's why certain movies, for example, are so resonant with almost everybody. You know, the, the hero's journey is one of those particular universal themes that um, really Joseph Campbell 
was one of the great one of the great uh, philosophers who brought that story to bear. He was actually George Lucas's uh, ph philosoph uh, philosophy teacher of some sort. And the entire story of Star Wars was actually built from the hero's journey. And I've studied the hero's journey, um, the science of it, and I've studied that. I've actually done lectures on that particular topic. And um, it's really fascinating because every single movie in Hollywood follows that particular theme, okay? Every single successful movie in Hollywood, this has been, this has been mapped out completely, that every single movie follows the, the scientific theme, the rhythmic theme of the hero's journey. You can't get away from it. It doesn't matter what particular movie it is. And if any movie does get away from it, it won't, it won't land, let's say. And that's a really important thing because if something is landing, if a movie or a story or a metaphor is landing for you, then you can be assured that it's stimulating something within your psyche. And, and I like to use the language stimulating something within your soul because that's really, really what's actually happening that is relevant to your journey. Because this journey of this, the hero's journey is the most relevant thing to all of us. You know, let's take um, entrepreneurship, for example. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an easy one. Um, entrepreneurship is a journey. And we say that all the time. It's a journey. But what kind of journey is it? Is it a journey to be successful? Whatever that means. If you only think of, uh, let's say, if you only think of your Purium business or your Purium journey as, okay, I'm trying to reach a particular goal, I'm trying to re reach a rank goal, I'm trying to make a certain amount of money, you, you're completely missing the whole point of the journey. Those are all byproducts. Those are all um, things that occur along the journey, but really what you're going through is an initiatory process of your own transformation. That's why I do like the perspective that, you know, uh, Purium is a personal development company with a compensation plan attached to it, because essentially what's occurring is that you have to go through certain experiences, certain challenges, certain initiations, certain things that are going to challenge the old version of you to upgrade, to, to transcend the old version of you. And that's an archetypical transformation. So let's talk about certain archetypes and what they mean. Um, so that, that kind of makes a little more sense. Like what is an archetype? Well, as I said, an archetype from a spiritual perspective is a disembodied spiritual force. It's a living force that seeks to embody itself through the people that are carrying that information. So essentially it's a set of information that's activating within each individual and each individual has the choice to take that information, to embody it and to express it in their own life. So for example, you know, the archetype of a mother, the archetype of the father, the archetype of the son, or the daughter. These are not just roles that we play in our lives or in society. These are deeply, deeply encoded archetypical themes that have a lot of depth and have a lot of meaning to it. You know, just the archetype of the mother has so many different subsets. It has so, it's not like, oh, I'm just a mother or I'm just a father, right? In, in whatever predefined um, set of uh, rules or instructions that that has um, kind of societally embedded into it, that's a deep, deep archetype that has many different subsets. One, so one of there's a great book that, especially for all men, every all men definitely need to read this book at some point. It's called The King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. And for every male archetype, there's also a feminine archetype too. So for example, um, in relationships, this is something, I mean, I just, I, I just really go deep into all this stuff and have for many years. So in relationships, um, the relationship template, let's say, especially um, the quote unquote evolved or conscious or spiritual based relationship template, there's different archetypical subsets of that. So for example, there's like, you know, we have our societal relationships or partnerships, which are just like a man and a woman. And then we have like dating and then marriage. And, you know, that's, it's kind of, it kind of ends there, right? You know, family, that kind of basic idea. Then you have, you have more nuanced relationship, archetypical templates, like more like soulmate, twin flame, 
uh, karmic relationships, um, et cetera, et cetera. These, these, these are much more deeper and nuanced and something that many people, if you actually understand the archetypes, you'll understand your relationships a little bit deeper. You'll be able to connect with that other person, but most importantly, you'll be able to connect with yourself and what's arising in your heart and your soul through the particular uh, dynamic or the archetype, the archetype that's seeking to live itself through you. So let's look at the, ma and, and by the way, the masculine is an archetype. The feminine is an archetype. It's not just like this new age, like, oh, divine masculine, divine feminine, um, watered down thing. It's an archetype that's universal throughout all time and space and all history. It's going back all the way to like Adam and Eve and in every single biblical story. These are very sacred and very important um, archetypes that encode information for essentially our own evolution. So, you know, going into the masculine side of things, the four main archetypes that, that live inside the masculine are the king, the warrior, the lover, and then the magician. And then when you think about these and other words for maybe like the magician is also like the alchemist, the shaman, the mystic, right? These are different, different um, words, different cultures have different words, but they all essentially have the same meaning. The magician is like the heal is also the healer, the shaman, the fool, different things like this. You have the warrior, which is the energy that is most pronounced in the world and has been for a long long time and there's there's different aspects of that as well the lover you know um, many different aspects of that and then ultimately from a masculine perspective we go through these phases in our life where we're we're exploring and initiating into each one of these archetypes so for example if you are engaging with the warrior archetype there's certain initiation points that lead you into what's called integration where you finally integrate and embody that energy as a part of you again the archetypes are are um they're in my my lingo spiritual energies that encode information about your own soul journey about your own evolution so for me i was born into the warrior archetype as a martial artist as an athlete i've i've lived that throughout my life so that's very well integrated into my particular template as a human being as a man and i've also explored the the what we call the light side of that and also the dark side of that and this is the other thing is that as you go through each particular initiation and integration, you also have to go to both sides of it. You have to actually integrate the light side and the, the dark side or the shadow aspect of that particular archetype. Because one of the things about transformation is that it, transformation is not transformation unless you've embodied the complete archetype or the complete experience whatever that may that experience may be in other words you have to re-own what has been disowned you have to re-own and, and recollect the pieces of yourself the pieces of your psyche that have been disowned or disintegrated from your conscious awareness and this happens a lot of times through um, wounding, trauma, um, different experiences, typically as children that we experience that are particularly painful and create a psychological separation. That's the, that's the clinical definition or interpretation of, of trauma. A lot of people, and I've talked about this a lot more often, uh, people think that trauma is an event that happened to them. So they'll keep thinking about the event, which re-triggers the nervous system and the emotional chemistry of the trauma but the experience that caused the trauma is not actually relevant it's actually what what end up happening is that through a particular experience it created a separation the separation is the trauma so let's just be really clear about that when you're working through particular interpersonal 
um, psychological and emotional, spiritual challenges to get fixated on the event like, oh, this, this thing happened in my relationship or this ha thing happened when I was a child, maybe you had a very traumatic, very unfortunate situation occur. And when you're a child, you don't have, your nervous system hasn't developed to have the capacity to process the, the trauma, to process the separation. So what happens is the psyche will, dis it will compartmentalize itself to redistribute that emotion that it's not able to process and the idea is that it'll come back later to fully process it but that tends to not happen until somebody later on in their 20s 30s 40s actually gets help because what ends up happening is that repressed separation inside of them it, it's still there it's still a living energy. So just because it got moved or it got pushed into the unconscious doesn't mean that it's not affecting somebody's, um, their life. In fact, this, so this whole thing about like, you know, co-creating your life and manifesting what you want. Well, you may think that you're manifesting what you want, but are you really? This is, this is a deeper thing. Maybe we don't really have the time to go into here, but that that's really that's really where the rubber meets the road because ultimately these are all archetypical entities that are seeking union that are seeking that's the whole kind of uh, template of what we call the twin flame dynamic is that it's a dynamic between the masculine and the feminine that are seeking union to create wholeness right and this, so this is within all of us there's a masculine and feminine some of us have a proclivity more towards masculine more towards feminine doesn't matter what your gender is that's not necessarily most relevant but ultimately it's a union it's a unification of the two energies that create life right same thing with water is a, is a combination of hydrogen and oxygen and when they merge together the earth and the sun when they come together they create water which is the most which is the wholeness the the birth of life in liquid gas in solid form and it's the it's the ultimate representation of spirit in matter actually water is the ultimate representation of spirit and matter because it can shift and form and, and imbue anything and it can form into anything in its environment it can become anything and it actually has information encoded into it based on the environment that that water has incubated inside of right so this is just very, very interesting. Um, there's just very interesting ways to, ways to, to kind of interpret this. But again, when we think of trauma, ultimately what a trauma is, is it's a, it's a disintegrated or an unintegrated archetype or a version of an archetype, typically the shadow side of an archetype that has not been brought to light. So in other words, what is held in the unconscious must become conscious in order for us to be whole, well, and complete, and actually to be healthy, to be psychologically healthy. You know, when you see people that are one way one day, but another day another day, or very easily triggered or certain things just come up, basically what that means is that there's something inside that person that hasn't been brought to the light and it hasn't been integrated as part of their personality, as part of their conscious awareness. And so that's the warrior archetype in our world because there's a lot of people now, especially in the Me Too and feminist movement that are like polarizing against the masculine as if, okay, like the masculine, the patriarchy, all that is completely, um, that's what's taken us the wrong course and we need to completely go the other way. It's like, as long as you have extreme polarity in our world, that's, that's the whole political system. That is how mind control actually works, is by driving extremes and polarity and driving somebody's psyche completely on one end of the spectrum where they're missing a whole body of data, a whole body of information. And actually those women, interestingly enough, in those groups are, are actually, this is the Watiko thing, if you remember that talk, they are embodying um, a shadow masculine component as their way of projecting against the very thing that they're, they're um, speaking against, right? And I actually think that's a really accurate example because I've been studying this a long time. I've been watching it in front of me and looking at the archetypes. It's not a, it's a general, it's a general um, example, 
but it, it shows up in our world. It shows up all over in our world. You could take it from a, and, it's, and, and this is the thing too, you have to get clear about your cognitive biases. Let's just speak about that real quickly here. You have to get clear about your cognitive biases in your life because what you're biased to in your mind, even Imperium, this shows up, let's take this as a good example. If you are of the, of the perspective that Imperium is everything, it's the only thing, it's the best thing ever, and anyone that does not agree with it is essentially wrong, that is a very deep cognitive bias that's not going to allow you to perceive the full body of data and let alone be able to see somebody else's perspective, right? And that's not going to be an effective way to develop relationships and to be able to um, actually have a full conversation, right? The same thing in that example I just made. Um, I'm not saying the feminist movement is wrong. I'm saying that a lot of the energy that is being projected or embodied is also another end of the coin because here's the thing you know if we go back to our first call about with tico which is the most important conversation that we could be having um in general in this book right here dispelling with tico breaking the curse of evil this is how all the archetype stuff came up for me because i've spent my life studying the nature of good and evil as a phenomenon you know we're very much we're very much all aligned on what we believe the the side of light or the side of good is right now, right? With Purium and the health and wellness and bringing healing to people's lives and the environment. And we're pretty clear that Monsanto is one of the primary entities or organizations that are embodying what we would call evil or a parasitic or a vampiric energy right? That's another way of thinking of it. Like evil, to dispel that a little bit, it's actually a parasitic vampiric energy that is taking but never giving, right? That's what a terminator genetically modified seed essentially is doing, is that it's taking but it doesn't actually give life. It just robs life. It robs nutrients. It robs, so it actually destroys the soil and doesn't allow the propagation of new seeds to take place. Right, so it's actually a parasitic energy, essentially, in our world. Um, where was I going with that point? <clears throat> so that, so the Watiko energy, and again, if you weren't on our call, our first call where we did a deep dive into this, essentially, the Watiko energy is the energy of, um, it's the energy of negativity. It's the energy of the shadow archetype. It's the energy of what we would call evil, the energy that opposes life. In other words, it's hyper-materialism. Um, in the scientific world, it's, it's something called scientism or hyper-atheism, which is essentially an energy or a movement to strip God or to strip spirit out of matter. In other words, everything is material. There is no metaphysics. There is no spirit. There is no um, energy socially. It's, um, it, it's, it's all matter. It's all based on the senses. It's all based on what I can see. It's all based on the survival of the fittest and stress fight or flight responses, right? It's an anti-life, anti-magic type of energy or archetype. Right? The best way to think about it so you can disassociate from the emotion of it is to actually just look at it as a necessary archetypical expression in our world that has an evolutionary purpose. So Monsanto, for example, so let me finish this point about the Wetiko. I'll go into this next point. So if we, if we are banning together, for example, and we are violently opposing Monsanto or any other entity, any other movement, any other thing that we deem as wrong or bad or outside of us, we are actually carrying that same energy that we're polarizing against, that we're project, we're actually, we couldn't pr uh, polarize against it unless we were projecting in it from, from within because we wouldn't be able to see it. And this is an important thing about quantum physics and the nature of reality. Once you get beyond the physical veil is you start to realize that, um, yeah, exactly, Jeremy, you can't fight fire with fire. What happens? It creates a bigger fire. However, there is a nuance to that. Sometimes 
you sometimes you have to use fire and this is and this is how you know let let's we'll we'll smooth it we'll slide into this perspective too sometimes you do have to fight fire with fire intelligently but you can't do it unless you've integrated the element of fire first so that is probably the biggest distinction there right you have to integrate the archetype you have to integrate the element before you can properly wield it before you can properly use it so you know you'll see this you'll see the difference with people that are very seasoned in the work they do you'll see the difference with people that are seasoned speakers or they're seasoned activists or they're seasoned spiritual leaders or whatever it's very different than the people that are very aggressive or they're just super passionate and they're just going out there and they have a message and they're going to act they're they're an advocate or they're an activist but it's almost like this fire that's burning out of control and it doesn't matter what it burns through and that's how the hero archetype actually becomes the villain and this is shown in all great stories like Cain and Abel and many other things um, in all you know great movies I think Batman the second Batman in particular was very interesting about this um, I'm not gonna go into the whole I mean that's a deep psychological rabbit hole how deep I studied that whole the whole mythology of Batman I thought that was so fascinating from an archetypical perspective but what can happen with people is if they go out on a mission but they're only partially integrated with their warrior energy right that fire that fire to create change to burn away the impurities that alchemical energy to create change but if they haven't properly integrated the shadow and the light of it together then what's probably going to happen is that that fire jeremy that you're talking about is either going to burn so bright that it just it ends up destroying the very thing that they were seeking to protect and it actually destroys the the noble part of that um ambition and it causes that person to turn into the very thing that they were opposing so i just just sit with that that's a very very deep thing to sit with you know a lot of people end up becoming the embodiment of the energy that they're looking to extinguish or they're looking to <clears throat> Uh, solve in the world and so so much of this process is actually just sitting with ourself it's sitting with ourself instead of actually going out into the world so quickly and trying to create a movement it's actually moving within and looking at yourself you know and looking at like how how does this energy show up in my life we, you know, so looking at the feminine principle, the masculine principle or archetype and the feminine archetype have to come into balance with one another, right? They have to come into balance with one another in our world. You know, one of the phrases I use sometimes when I'm being interviewed to describe kind of the, the situation that we, we have in our world is that we have a scientific, um, a scientific vehicle that's mostly not really scientific, but it's, a, it's hijacking the scientific method and it's, it's, it's under the guise of science and material, but it's really an atheistic materialistic agenda called scientism that's not really objectively scientific, but most people have been programmed to think that that's scientific. So for example, vaccines vaccines are scientifically proven there's not one scientific study to prove the safety and effectiveness of vaccines not one you'll never find one it doesn't exist because it's not scientific it's scientismic there's an agenda behind it right same thing with glyphosate and and monsanto and genetic modification of food and and all this stuff right there's not actually any there's not actually any realistic science behind it. Now, what's interesting about this is that science, real science is absolutely necessary, but science must be coupled with philosophy, right? And this is the masculine and feminine kind of uh, uh, dynamic here is that they're not, if they don't combine one or the other will be on um, opposite spectrum. So for example, if you have only science, but no philosophy, you're going to create chaos right if you have philosophy with no science then you're going to have fantasy 
right? You're just going to be philosophizing and just talking about things, talking about just, just like talking about ideas, but there's no roadmap. There's no action involved. So you can't actually, you can't manifest anything. It's just talk, right? And that's what happens if you go too feminine from a, from a, um, almost from a shadow archetype perspective that hasn't been integrated with the masculine, then it's just like, let's talk all day. Let's not really, well, let's talk about what we're going to do. Let's talk about our dreams and let's feel good about it, but without any real intention to follow through the next day and put pen to paper and actually go forward. Right. And the same thing here is like hyper action, manic action, anxiousness to the point where it actually causes adrenal adrenal fatigue in a, in a you know um, chronic adrenal fatigue syndrome it causes all kinds of issues right so and that's the world we live in just hyper stressed out hyper anxiousness manicness fear doubt all that kind of stuff so that has so those those two sides of the spectrum archetypically have to be integrated within the individual so they can become unified and then they can go out into the world and actually make the true grounded difference, but they can also activate their visionary capability so they can see beyond where they are right now and they can see the roadmap and they can take the necessary actions to get them to where they wanna go. And this archetype is just really like, it's really the feminine and masculine um, archetype that I'm, that I'm describing. So let's pause for just a second here. Again, archetypes, and this is, this is very deep. You have to really like make a study of this. You have to really be willing to kind of go down the rabbit hole a little bit of your own experience. So when we think of the feminine archetypes, because we talk about the masculine, we talked about um, a little bit about the warrior, the lover, the, um, the, uh, the oh, this is the point I wanted to make. Um, the warrior, the lover, and the magician or the healer each one of these has its own initiation. So you might initiate yourself into adopting and embodying the warrior energy, the warrior that can go out into the world and make a difference and make a stand and stand up for something that he or she believes in, right? That's that warrior energy. And I'm speaking from particularly the, the light side of it, not the shadow side of it, but just like the, the, um, the virtuous side of it. So the virtuous warrior, not the patriarchal warrior that suppresses and is essentially suppressing the feminine energy that because it's afraid of it, because if it integrates with the feminine, it's going to lose its power or its control, which is exactly what needs to disintegrate in order for that warrior to become a virtuous, fully embodied warrior. We have the lover. And by the way, this is masculine feminine. So I'm just I'm speaking from a man's perspective, but it, it, it translates both ways. The lover, you might be initiating in a phase of your life where you're initiating to more the lover archetype. You're, you're more into poetry. You're more into music. You're more into art. You're more into sensuality. You're more into the tactile, emotional experiences of life, right? So that's where you get deeper into the heart, right? And that's the, that's the lover energy. And there's a shadow side of that too, where you can let your emotions get away from you and you can make decisions emotionally instead of rationally based on observation, based on discernment, based on logic. Because logic is actually very important. This is the whole spiritual community is like, no, logic's not important. No, 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 no. Actually, logic's really important because you have a memory and your memory is designed to remember things that were potential threats or, or situations that you don't want to um, continue, patterns and habits and situations that you don't want to recreate in your future. So logic and rationale are very important, but they're, but they're, they're part of an integrated puzzle, right? So that, that's really like, you, you know, that's, that's the lover archetype and you explore that and you feel that and you integrate that that into yourself, then you go into, maybe you're going into the, the magician or the alchemist or the, the shaman, the, the healer energy, which is a mystic energy. It's more of a, it's, it's kind of like if you look at the archetype of the shaman or the alchemist, this is an individual that has one foot in both worlds, the physical world and the non-physical or non-local world. And this is where, this is the energy of manifestation. 
This is the energy of the visionary, the energy of bringing something in the invisible and making it visible, right? Um, and the, the, there's a shadow to that too, because if you're not integrated and grounded in that energy, then it can be more kind of fantastical thinking. It can be escapism, escaping reality, creating fantasies and hopes and pipe dreams and desires that have nothing to do with reality, right? And this, this shows up a lot. I've, and I've been through all of these, by the way. That, and that's something we all go through is to have the awareness of what archetype is playing out in my life right now. Where am I at right now? Am I in more of that lover energy? Am I more in that, that alchemical, mystic, magician energy, that healer energy? Am I more into my warrior energy? And here's the thing. So once those three particular archetypes, they integrate and embody within you, then as a man, then you step into becoming a king. And the king is the archetype that the king of his, his kingdom, right? The king that can rule his kingdom. And the tyrant, the unintegrated king, is, is, becomes a tyrant, right? That's the shadow of that, where he becomes a tyrant and he, he, um, you know, he, he hasn't integrated with his lover energy. He's hyper warrior energy. He hasn't integrated with his magician or the magical aspects of life. He hasn't integrated with that. So he's actually suppressing out of fear and control and so once those archetypes have been integrated into one's being, then he can now ascend or evolve into the noble king, the generous king, the virtuous king, because every stage below was an initiation leading him into wholeness, into completeness with himself. And it's the same thing for the feminine. So, you, you know, these archetypes are very, they're universal. You have the magician, or in other words, that might be like the sorceress or the priestess, right? The, myth, the feminine mystic. And that's something that we're seeing a lot in our world right now, especially in certain niches and circles where that energy is coming out, right? And um, that, that healer energy from the feminine is coming out. <clears throat> and as that integrates... And then maybe the feminine starts to adopt the warrior s, the lioness energy, right? And she starts to take her power back. And sometimes, just going back to the whole like kind of Me Too feminist movement, um, sometimes the way that that plays out is a is a is a um, a, a massive departure from the patriarchy, right? The patriarchy, by the way, is not all bad. I'm just going to put that there. I'm just going to put that seed right there. I just feel like I need to put that there because. That's how society was created. That's why our lights work. That's why we have a plumbing system. It's, it, 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 it was the beneficial aspects of that particular archetype, but when gone out of balance, without the feminine involved, then it becomes that suppressive force. And so to, to break away from that, 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 that warrior within the feminine has to happen to create that that split, but you, but once that happens, then the integration of the feminine in her true power, not her shadow power, where she's polarizing, but where she's integrating her masculine. That's essentially the, the simplest way to think about it, where she's actually unifying with her own masculine archetype, and then she becomes whole and complete, and she can provide for herself, whatever that means, right? And then, you know, again, from the feminine, the lover archetype, you know, that's pretty natural for most women, but in our socially conditioned world, that's actually more of a challenge because that requires a lot of depth. So one thing that we are seeing more is women that are, that are, that are ex freely expressing themselves, that are opening themselves a lot more to sensuality, not necessarily sexuality. However, that is also playing out too in these different um, these different templates of relationships and open relationships and in all the ways that that plays out. Those are all experiments leading to an integration point. They're experimental paths that some people will go in relationships because they're not satisfied with the brick and mortar constrained version of monogamy or the way that it's been imposed upon us. So it's, these are all experimental things, by the way. I just want to say that none of this is like completely like cut and dry the whole point of the journey the hero's journey is that you have to be willing to experiment with life you have to be willing to experiment with yourself to find out what sticks 
what's true for you because what's true for me or what's true for someone else may not be your particular journey. So you also have to be aware of what resonates with me right now. What about this talk resonates with me right now? And so as we, as we integrate all that, then as the, as the feminine integrates that, what happens? She embodies the queen energy, right? Not like the going to, going to parties and doing whatever substance is and dancing around saying, oh, I'm a queen. That's not what I'm talking about. That's, that's actually, that's actually like more of a, that's more of a, a disintegrated or unintegrated version of the, the mystic and the lover. I'm not, and I'm not judging by the way, I'm not judging. I'm saying, I'm just observing. I've done a lot of observing and I've also done a lot of, a lot of my own relationship uh, experiences. So I have a lot of data to pull from here. Um, and my mystic is very much alive, so I can kind of see the broad strokes of how all this stuff is played out in the psychological department. But anyways, that's all part of the evolution anyway. So once, once the feminine gets to that point where she's embodied her warrioress energy, her lioness energy, and then her, her lover energy, and grounds that and anchors that in, and it's really about self-love, right? Um, and also the ability to also participate in a loving dynamic um, wholly and completely with someone. And then also her, her healer, her mystic, her magician, her shamanistic energy as well. Once that's all integrated, then she can finally embody the totality of all that, which is the queen, where the queen occupies her queendom, right? She can occupy her queendom and all the varying parts of the queendom. And then on the, the, the bigger scale, which is the, the, um, the union principle, then a king and a queen can actually come together in, in union. Sometimes they, come, they, they move through and they oscillate through and they move through together or they, they meet up on the other end. However, all these things play out, right? Um, but ultimately, from an archetypical perspective, that's my, that's my, um, that's kind of like a little journey to take you guys through here. Um, let me pause for a second because there's a lot of, there's a lot that was just said, and this is just kind of stream of consciousness. I don't really think about this ahead of time. So let's just pause with that for a second. If you're a man, by the way, highly recommend this book. Again, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. It's a, it's a short read, but it's a very easy read. Very great to go into. For anyone that really wants to go deeper into the Watiko phenomenon and study who's interested in these things, the nature of good and evil and how deep that really goes, then Dispelling Watiko is a really, really good book. I'm, I'm working on a book that brings in all this stuff, by the way. It brings in all of these perspectives, um, the archetypes, psychology, Carl Jungian psychology, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to pause for just a moment here. Um, I'm actually going to open this up um, to, create a, to create an added dialogue because the, the truth is like this is an endless this is an, oh, you know what? I actually, there is something I want to, I want to bring to, and by the way, I'm willing to stay on longer too. So don't worry about it. Um, if you, if you want to stay on longer, this is the great conversation. So actually a great conclusion point to all of this is the, the archetype or the metaphor of the dragon. This is ultimately the most important thing. And, but you can't get here until you've gone through the initiations just like the hero's journey. What is the metaphor of the dragon really about? Well, the dragon hoards the gold, right? The dragon hoards the gold. What, what's, what's, the point? what's the metaphor of that? Well the, well, the gold is what you're seeking. And the gold is a metaphor, obviously. It's, it's the prize for going through the journey. Why do we do anything? Why do we go on these journeys? Well, there's something that we're seeking. There's something that our, our soul is calling us to go towards and develop the courage, the faith, the persistence, the, the resilience, everything that we need to go through the journey. Eventually, we meet the dragon. The dragon is the symbolic representation of the thing that we're most afraid of. Essentially, it's facing your greatest fear. That's what the dragon is. And until you face your fear, you can't actually get what you're seeking. So, so essentially, it's facing your greatest fear is what 
allows you to receive the the reward for the journey so to speak and the reward is non uh, material necessarily it's not local it's it's not a pot of gold it's not money and that's why i said with purium or any entrepreneurial endeavor a true the archetype of an entrepreneur is not somebody out there making money that's a shadow entrepreneur that's a wantrepreneur that's not an actual entrepreneur. The archetype of an entrepreneur is somebody that has a dream and a vision to make a contribution on the planet and to help other people and has structured their life in such a way where they can effectively go out in the world and, and do that and also create a form of exchange and create a business around but it's not because they want to build a business. It's because they want to make a difference on the planet. That is the integrated um, archetype of the entrepreneur. So, so you know, this, this goes a lot deeper. You can go into like entrepreneurialism. What's the archetype of entrepreneur? What's the archetype of the mother? What's the archetype of the father? What's the archetype of the son? What's the archetype of the daughter, right? The, the sins of the father are passed down to the son if the if the lessons of the father have not been healed and integrated it epigenetically and lineagely ancestrally will be deposited onto the son for him to work through those things, which weren't his, but are his now. And he is the one who has to take those on. That's the archetype of, of that particular thing. Just to point that out. That, and that's something that's been a theme in my life. That's why it's relevant to me because I've actually had to go through that particular journey so anyways the the thing about the dragon is that you know this whole idea of slaying the dragon well the dragon is actually in you and you can't so this is the distinction is that you can go out in the world and you can put out fires and you can conquer and slay dragons outside of you and you can go change the world but there's something inside of you that hasn't rested it's not resting yet right no matter what you accomplish in the world there's still something within that won't let you go where you can't quite find peace. And that's because the dragon isn't outside of you. That's a holographic projection. And if you continue to holographically project that dragon outside of you, you will find an endless amount of dragons to slay until you actually go within and you look at the things that you've been avoiding. You know, you look at the things that are nagging at you, right? And a dragon doesn't become a dragon overnight. A dragon starts as a little kitten, right? That could be like a little bill or something that you have to pay. But if you ignore it for a year, two years, three years, then that little kitten grows up and becomes like a lion. And then it has fangs and teeth, right? And then eventually it becomes a dragon that you have to muster all of your forces, all of, all of who you are, in order to to uh, face it right that's and that's how it's that's just the practicality of all this right this is all kind of like very interesting symbolic metaphorical language but ultimately it's the most practical thing ever and i think it's the most interesting perspective on the human journey because you know we're not just here in this material world you know, just like living our day to day life, that's an illusion. Like what we're doing is we're playing out archetypes, we're playing out parables, we're playing out metaphors that are relevant um, to, to uh, you know, to, um, or I should say the parables and the metaphors and the stories, the biblical stories, the, the mythological stories, um, the movies that we're so inspired by, they're delivering archetypical information that's informing us about our own journey right so just take that in think about all the movies that you've ever been inspired by for me star wars i think is like the greatest movie ever the greatest series ever and and every single movie similar to that is like it's a fall from grace it's it's an emergence of the reluctant hero stepping into stepping into becoming a hero not because he wants to be but because he's forced to be he's chosen essentially and has to face the forces of darkness and the forces of darkness typically were on the side of light at one point but they got corrupted by the darkness or the Wetiko, and then they got tempted and persuaded into becoming the embodiment and the the figurehead for 
that invisible archetypical energy that needed to embody itself in a person. So it chose this person over here. And that's why I bring up the whole activism thing, because it's no different than Anakin Skywalker right? It's no different. Yeah. Lord of the Rings, the ring, the temptation, it keeps gnawing at you. It keeps whispering at you, right? The subtle temptations. Oh no, it's no big deal. It's, it's, it's just in our world, right? Like, oh, moderation or like sleeping around or, or eating junk food. It's like, oh, I just do it here and there. Okay. But you're planting seeds and you're giving in you're opening yourself up. You're giving in just a little bit. And if you keep giving in, you keep giving into that, eventually it's going to become an addiction. And an addiction is something that you can't do without. It's something that has a hold on you, right? And because you've given your power away to it because, oh, I'm just, I'm just moderation or experimentation or I'm just... Um, uh, you know, it's kind of an escapism, right? And that's, and I just drive that point because then that little thing that you were given your power away to becomes your dragon that you have to face eventually. And that's, that's, that's a whole nother perspective on the archetype of addiction and how subtle these addictions can be and how our society is completely constructed to addict you to its means of control. And so that's why, you know, like, to, that's why I don't, I don't eat junk food. I don't even go, it's not even food to me. Like, you know, animal food, meat, all that. It's not even food to me because I've, I've extricated myself from that system. I've made the distinction. I know exactly what that is. And I'm not going to feed into that anymore because I don't want to give my power away because my journey is about becoming completely integrated archetypically with all of the forces that I have, and I'll conclude this whole thing on this point, is that why is this so important to understand? Why do we need to get a grasp of this? Well, we need to understand this because in order for us to be all that we're going to be in this world, we have, it's going to take all that we have for that to happen. If we're actually going to accomplish our mission, if we're actually going to overthrow the empire, so to speak, it's going to take all of us to do, and I don't mean all of us as a, as, as a group, I mean all of us as individuals. It's going to take everything you got in your life, your emotional energy, your, your psychological energy, your physical energy. That's why anything that's robbing you, anything that's robbing you of your energy, you have to, you have to deal with it. You have got to deal with and slay that dragon because the, the gold behind the dragon is your own transcendence of, of it. It's your own transcendence. It's your own evolution. It's who you become. That's what they say. Like Jim Rohn said that it's not about what you get. It's about who you become, right? It's actually the journey and slaying the dragon is about who you become through the enduring the challenges of the journey and what it molds you into. That's the alchemical process. And that's the fire, the fire burning away and disintegrating the impurities. So the rarefied Phoenix that only comes once in a millennia or whatever can actually emerge from the ashes. And that's what, and that's the journey that each one of us is on. So um, that is a lot right there. I'm going to pause on that note. I'm going to uh, maybe hand this back over to Roxanne and um, then we can either have a little dialogue or if there's any questions or anything that we want to um, dive a little bit deeper into, I'm happy to stay on. Awesome. Thank you, Ronnie. <laughs> Just from watching the chat, I can tell that a lot of this has really landed for pretty much everyone on here. And I'm so glad to just be opening up this sort of conversation. And um, we are at the top of the hour, but I do want to just put the talking stick in the middle. And if anybody has a comment or a question or something that you want to bring to the circle. Hi, Jilly. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi, Ronnie. I love your stuff. It resonated so much for me in my business and uh, being in network marketing. And I wanted to add for you ladies out there, um, I went through the magician archetype and I learned about it through Carl Jung. And 
One thing that we discovered is there's something called the Sophia Code. Um, and it's basically with these ascended masters and stepping into your sensuality rather than, you know, just sexuality and really owning that in your business. Um, it's helped me a lot get through a lot of things. And one thing that actually really changed the game for me was uncovering our innocence through this archetype of, you know, you go through um, Mother, uh, Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, the white buffalo calf woman. These are the type of archetypes in this Sophia Code. And it says that, you know, we're leading us back to our innocence where everything we do behind us, we are not guilty, we are innocent. So sharing my business from an innocent standpoint, saying, yes, I am innocent, I am doing this out of my heart, has completely flipped the game. So, you know, people kind of think in network marketing, we don't have an innocent background. You can kind of really own this archetype and own this innocence so that people see that you're coming from the heart and that we're not guilty anymore, we're not shameful. So I just wanted to share that because it helped me tremendously. <laughs> yeah, another another thing about the Sophia Code, like another, Anaya Sophia is actually a really great compliment to that too. Her work is really, really powerful. So that this book, I just happen to have, Sacred Sexual Union, it's, it's really kind of goes deeper into the soulmate, twin flame dynamic and all that, if that's of interest. But um, yeah, I just thought about that with the Sophia Yeah, Code. I just thought that book. Yeah, I'm reading that right now, actually. That's so funny. <laughs> Thank you. I see that somebody had just raised their hand. Um, if, if you raised your hand, you can go ahead and not find you. Oh, here we go. Tamara, do you want to ask a question, love? Hey, Tamara. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Roxanne. Appreciate you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, this is this is I'm consolidating 
you know, over a decade worth of study, like this is, this is, this isn't even the work that I do funny enough. Like this is all just side study and exploration that I'm deep into. Cause I'm 100% committed to this work. Like I'm not going out and dating or going out for drinks or, or anything like that. Like my life is more and more pretty much consumed by my own exploration um, into the fringes of, of, not just consciousness, but, but integrating consciousness into physical embodiment as my own life and all the different things that, that I'm bringing into the world. Right. Um, I, and I just feel like, um, these are conversations that are not discussed really almost anywhere. I think Jordan Peterson is the only person that is bringing these messages to the mainstream. He, if you haven't heard of Jordan Peterson, I highly recommend you really tune into him. He's probably, he has the single best-selling book in the world right now. Um, and he's actually, he's actually bringing a lot of these archetypes and these psych psychological motifs to the mainstream, which I think is really interesting, really telling of the times that we're moving into. It's really telling of how critically important these ideas are and i guess in closing words like you know the key word is just the key word is integration right like so and that goes with everything you know and just taking it taking it easy on your journey i don't mean taking it easy in terms of like st stepping back and not doing enough but i mean taking it easy on yourself because there's different forces there's different energies that are moving through you at any given time and in order to slay that dragon, it's not a patriarchal shadow warrior that's going to do it, right? It's going to be that, that noble king or that virtuous queen that's going to be able to face that dragon. The dragon is your fear. It's what you're afraid of. It's the thing that you're avoiding, the thing that you don't want to confront within you or in your life, the small things that we don't want to confront. But the more that we can do that, we realize that those fears are actually just smoke and mirrors. We realize that they're actually just illusions that have had a bit of a hold on us. And why that's so important is because if our energy is, is fragmented and it's leaking, then we're not going to be able to make the difference on the planet that we can. And I don't know about any of you, but um, I don't think we really have time to waste. I don't think we have energy to waste. You know, we really need to pull in our full faculties and bring everything together, not just for how that's going to benefit our life, but how that's going to manifest the peace and the abundance and the love and the health and the well-being that we want to bring on the planet. Each one of the last thing I'll say about this that comes out of all these archetypes is ultimately is you are responsible. It's taking radical responsibility for your life, taking responsibility for all the relationships that you're involved, whether you were done wrong or you did someone else wrong. It's taking responsibility for participating in every single aspect of your life and seeing both sides of it, seeing the, the sides that we want to see and seeing the sides we don't want to see so we can integrate. So we're not operating from a biased perspective that only sees what it wants to see because that's scientism. That's what's plaguing our world right now. Um, so we got to, we got to really open our mind and we got to open our heart and we got to open ourselves up. So spirit, the spirit, can actually the spirit of the archetype can embody us like it's the spirit of the father right what is that well that is the the father not your father my father but the father the holy father so to speak i'm not really religious either i'm just very into these interesting these interesting archetypes or metaphors because i can see how relevant they really are so you know it's 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 there's a lot there there's a lot to be said i can continue to go on and on but Ultimately, it's about really loving yourself enough to evolve, love yourself enough to really face um, the things you need to face and take it lightly because this is all this is all props and stages anyways. This is all just one big game anyways, like this whole human experience. When you get into the archetypes, you realize it's not actually as like serious because you realize, oh, this is just a soul's journey then that must mean that this body is an avatar that my soul is moving around. And I've done this many, many times before, and I'll probably continue to do it many more times in the future. And what an amazing time to be here right now 
with this community of other activated, illuminated human beings on the planet where we're all at this particular um, critical moment in time where we actually plan to be here. And these are archetypes that are playing out in our, our lives to allow us to become all that we can become. So I want you to look at all this in your life as with excitement with total excitement, even when you're going through those dark, edgy moments, it's exciting because it's part of the game, right? It's just like leveling up in a video game. It doesn't get easier. It gets more challenging, but you're now more capable to, of, of playing at the next level. And you're stronger, you're smarter, you're more resilient, you're more, you're just, you're more developed. So it just, it just keeps going. And that's the beauty. And that's the, that's the entertaining aspect of life. So um, that's, that's it for me. I'm going to, I'm going to conclude on that note. Perfect. I love it. And Jody, so that's what we're doing here. You guys we are expanding our toolbox and expanding our dialogue and creating culture together, which I so appreciate. So thanks Ronnie again for all your wisdom and thanks everybody for being here. And um, tomorrow we have a prospecting zoom uh, at 11 o'clock uh, Pacific time. We're going to have Dave Sandoval on the line as well as our very own Ray of Light uh, talking about CBD and the future of healthcare. So if you guys have people that are interested in CBD and want to learn more either about the product side or the business side, we will be discussing both. And um, that's a great opportunity to promote to your prospects and bring them on there at desk. We'll have a Q&A time. I'm going to be walking people through ordering and there's a promotional copy and an image for that on our A team page, as well as on my personal Facebook page. So if you guys want to spread that out, I've been sharing it publicly and then going through and directly inviting people who I think will really benefit from that sort of a platform. So thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll see you guys tomorrow for the CBD prospecting zoom. Love you all. Bye. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.